You may be seated, friends. We want to welcome you to Stillwater Church. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm just honored to get to worship Jesus here with you. Uh, we're in a series uh, this summer called Pump the Brakes, uh, where we're using some kind of driving or road analogies uh, to talk about slowing things down a little bit so that we can grow in our spiritual lives. Summer's oftentimes a time where things kind of dial back in certain ways. And the question is, will we invest ourselves in things and in ways that help us to grow in our faith? Because because Jesus wants us to grow all the time, and this is a great time for us to grow closer to him. So today we're using an illustration of a HOV lane, or high occupancy vehicle lane, right? Now, if you only drive around Dayton, you might not be familiar with this, because we have traffic, but not like that level of traffic, right? We, we tend to excel more in construction, right? We have tons of construction, but we don't have HOV lanes. And, and in a large city, we've kind of got an image of this here, the, the lane like on the left-hand side there is specifically for vehicles that have multiple people in them. Uh, sometimes the law says two or three, it just depends on the area. And so you can't drive there if you're just driving by yourself. The purpose is to encourage carpooling, to encourage efficiency, and so hopefully you're taking more people, you can move along a little bit more quickly. Now, again, you are not legally allowed to, to drive there if you don't have others with you, okay? Just ask the guy who tried and got busted with this thing in his front seat here, right? That's, I think the day that you order one of those online is a very sad, sad day, you know? I mean, if really, if that's, if, if you got to order an HOV dummy to, uh, justify your driving in the lane. That seems kind of sad, but regardless. Uh, so, so we need others with us. One of our beliefs here at Stillwater is that you can't do life alone. Uh, we need to be in community groups. We need to be uh, helping each other grow in our faith. Uh, but today it's kind of a different focus from that. We're really focusing on the fact that we need God's presence in our life. We need to make Jesus the Lord, just like what we were singing about, surrendering our life to him, giving ourselves to him more and more fully so that we listen to him. You know, Methodists believe that salvation is a free gift from God, right? Ephesians chapter 2 says it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and all this is a gift from God, right? Not of works, so that nobody can boast about it. You, you and I can't earn that. Our salvation is truly a free gift from Jesus. Uh, but on the other hand, the, in the book of James, it says that by our works that we will be known, or by our fruits, the, the fruits of the Spirit that are shown in our lives, we will be known. So you don't earn your salvation, yes, but by the same token, if you are a follower of Jesus, your lifestyle should reflect that. If I say I'm a follower of Jesus, but there's zero impact in my life, you really ought to question, am I actually following Jesus? Because there should be evidence of this. Okay, so, so we don't earn our salvation, but yet our, our deeds should show it. St. Augustine said it this way. I think you should write this one down. He said, pray as though everything depends upon God, and work as though everything depends upon you. Okay, those are kind of a tension there, right? And, and many of us tend to excel on one side or the other of that. The first part, pray as though everything depends upon God. I mean, factually speaking, we know that. We know that everything depends upon God. We know that we should be praying, we should be talking to God. Uh, but sometimes we struggle to do so. We don't invest the time in prayer that, that we should. I had a pastor say one time that he believes that when we get to heaven someday and we can see the impact of our prayers, we will wish that we spent a whole lot more time praying. I think there's some truth to that. So we pray as though everything depends upon God. We need to listen to God. We need to talk to God. But also, we work as if it depended on us because sometimes... God uses us. In fact, oftentimes God uses us. Like, let's say your neighbor uh, loses their job, right? And they're struggling to have groceries at home. Okay, simple example. You certainly should pray for that person. You should certainly be in prayer for them. But if God's given you the resources and you've got some extra food or some extra money to buy food, don't just pray about it, right? Go do something about it as well. Be generous. Let God use you in that way. We do both of these things together, and that's, that's important. Now, in talking about driving, 
I don't know if anybody else in here is like me, but when I am in a car with others, there's one seat I want to be sitting in. You probably know which one, right? I want to be driving, right? Anybody else like that? When you're, Yeah, that's right. And see, these people are raising their hands with me. It's not that we're arrogant or something like that. We just, we understand the fact that we are definitely the best driver in the car. And no one can drive as well as we can, right? It's, it's a simple fact, you know? I mean, so we want, to, we want to be driving, right? And for people with our wiring, it can be challenging to put Jesus where he belongs. Because the truth is, Jesus belongs in the driver's seat of your life. That's what making him the Lord means, okay? That's what making him the Lord means, is putting him in the driver's seat. You remember a number of years back, there was that popular uh, license plate or bumper sticker that said, God is my co-pilot? Remember that? That's some really bad theology, right? Because a co-pilot is like an assistant pilot, right? So if the pilot needs to, like, have lunch or take a nap or go to the bathroom, whatever, there's the co-pilot. He can take over. We're good to go. That's not God's role in your life, right? If you have God as your co-pilot, you'll probably end up like this car right here, right? <laughs> because for me, if God is my, like, backup assistant driver, well, I'll wreck the car long before I give him the wheel, right? God is not to be a co-pilot in our life. He's to be the one that we're listening to. He's to be our central focus. Proverbs 3 says it this way, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. When we seek God's will, when we put him first, when we listen to God above just our own opinions, uh, I love what it says in verse 7, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. <laughs> It's pretty easy to get pretty impressed with our own stuff, right? But don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, verse, uh, instead, instead, fear the Lord and turn from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. It's a reference to tithing. That's what, that's what it's referencing there of giving God the best part of everything we produce. If you want to see growth and increase in your life, be more generous, right? If you want to uh, have wisdom in your life, listen to God. Listen to his wisdom. When is the toughest time to do this? When are the toughest times to trust God with our whole heart? Well, for most of us, it's when our backs are up against the wall. When life is really tough, we tend to struggle to listen to others at that point. We want to think that we've got it, right? So there's a guy named Moses in the Bible. You've probably heard of him. Remember, Moses was born into captivity. He was born into slavery in Egypt. His parents were Hebrew slaves uh, there in Egypt. And at the time, the Pharaoh was, he was killing all the male Israelite children who were born because he was afraid their nation was becoming too strong. So his mom desperately puts Moses into this basket and puts him out into the river just because she can't stand the idea that, that he's going to be killed by the Pharaoh. Well, God intervenes, and, and wouldn't you know, the Pharaoh's own daughter is down at the river, and she finds this baby in the basket and brings him home and raises Moses as her own son right there in the palace. So Moses goes from being the this, this, uh, child of slaves to now being the child of royalty. Well, one day, uh, when he gets older, he grows up, Moses is out, and he sees an Egyptian just, just beating a Hebrew slave without mercy. It makes Moses angry. And Moses, uh, justifiably angry, but makes a bad choice. Uh, he chooses to kill this Egyptian and bury his body there in the sand. So Moses becomes like, he moves up to the top of Pharaoh's like most wanted list, right? And so Moses is in deep trouble and he flees the country. He never plans to come back to Egypt. He marries a woman. Uh, he works for her father or for her father. So Moses is out and he's tending his father-in-law's sheep one day and he sees this crazy thing, right? Remember, it was this bush that was burning, but it was not consumed. And and, and, and this catches Moses' attention because this is not normal. So he goes over, stands by it, and God uses this bush to get his attention and to speak to him. And God calls Moses to, to follow him on a very incredible mission. He sends him to Egypt, reluctantly. Moses didn't want to go. But he sends him to Egypt, and Moses goes to tell Pharaoh, let God's people go. Well, it doesn't go so well. 
Pharaoh's not interested in letting God's people go because they're slave labor, right? And you've seen these incredible pyramids before, right? And I think, I think we got an image of that, maybe. Uh, and so I, I love this statement. You can do anything you set your mind to when you have vision, determination, and an endless supply of expendable labor, right? Because this is what Pharaoh had. He, they would take over other nations, they would make them their slaves, they wouldn't pay them anything, and they'd make them do all the building projects. Works nice if you're the Pharaoh, but it was an awful evil thing to do. So, so Pharaoh doesn't want to let the Israelites go. God sends ten plagues, eventually Pharaoh gives in, and, and Pharaoh releases the people. The Egyptians give them a whole bunch of their stuff on the way out, and so the Israelites march out into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. But very quickly, things get dicey, right? Because here's the Israelites, they're, they're a bunch of slaves, right? They, they don't have a lot of military training or whatever. And they're on their way when Pharaoh changes his mind. He realizes, how am I going to get stuff done around here? I mean, I got pyramids to build, right? If I don't have these Hebrew slaves around, who's going to do all my work for me? So he sends out his army to go after him, to go get him. And, and, and the Egyptian army is chasing him, and the Israelites are, are backed up to the Red Sea. And it's an awful situation. It appears that they're going to be slaughtered right there. Uh, in verse 14, or sorry, Exodus 14, verse 10, listen to what the people say. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and said to Moses, Why did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen when we were still in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Now, this wasn't actually true, right? They were actually crying out to God, asking for God to free them. But, you know, our memories get a little tainted when we think we're going to die, right? And so the people are there, and they're challenging Moses. They're blaming Moses. They're, they're angry, and, and they say, Let, we should go back to Egypt, right? Throughout the Israelites' journey in the wilderness, there's going to be numerous times where things go badly, and their response is always the same. Let's go back to Egypt. I had a professor in seminary who said, if you're going to lead change at a church, if you're going to actually do things to reach new people for Jesus, he said, in every church you go to, there will always be a back to Egypt committee, right? The ones who say, uh-uh, we can't do this, right? That's not the way we do things here. Back to Egypt, right? We're not doing this. That's not true so only in churches, friends. That's true in your own personal life. There's always going to be back to Egypt people in your life. Uh, it may be some of your friends, it may be coworkers, it may be family members, but you start trying to work on something and there's somebody who without a, without fail will tell you you need to go back, right? Well, what do you think? You think you can actually stop smoking those cigarettes? You've been doing that for years, right? You, you got to be kidding yourself. Just, Back to Egypt, right? Or, or you want to get, you know, you want to get healthy, right? You want to start eating the right foods or start exercising or whatnot. You've got terrible habits and no self-control, right? Back to Egypt. You think your marriage can be any better? You guys haven't had a close relationship for years or maybe decades, right? It's not going to get any better than that. Back to Egypt. You think finances can be any different? You, you, you've always spent all your money on yourself. How do you think you're going to live generously and give to others? Back to Egypt. No matter what you do in life, there's going to be somebody telling you to go back there. There's always going to be a pharaoh who's chasing you down, and there's going to be a back to Egypt committee telling you that there's no hope. So what do we do about that? How do we handle that? What, well, what did Moses do? Why don't we listen to Moses' words, but this time we'll hear them from uh, Charlton Heston, perhaps the best Moses other than Moses himself, right? Let's check this out. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you took us away to die in the wilderness? Why must we die? Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Oh my gosh, it's a Pikachu. Get your phones out. Don't miss it, right? <laughs> this was actually a test. I was waiting to see how many people would snap a quick picture and run on out, right? Because that's the only reason they showed up today, right? 
All right. For those of you who don't understand, you're like, I saw that movie in the 50s in the theater, and there was no Pikachu in that movie, right? What? Are you? Yeah, we, we added that. But anyway, sorry for the sacrilegious stuff there, but <laughs> what was about to happen is a pillar of fire coming down. This is how God, and it's interesting what Moses says to the people. He, he says to them very simply, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Now, when your back's up against the Red Sea and the Pharaoh is bearing down on you, stand still doesn't seem like the best advice. <laughs> Listen, learn, hear what God is saying. Uh, we'd rather run or fight or something like that, right? Doesn't this seem like a time for action? Moses says, the Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Friends, Moses listened to God. One of the biggest lessons we see throughout Moses' life, he makes plenty of mistakes, but he consistently listens to God. He consistently tunes his ears to the voice of God. He wants to hear what God has to say, and he wants to follow those, the, those words. The presence of God would be with God's people in, in powerful ways. That pillar of fire would come down and, and, and would protect them from the Egyptians. And, and eventually, you've probably heard the story before, or you've seen the movie at least, right? That's like one of the longest movies ever made, isn't it? I remember when I was a kid, that movie would show on TV when I was little, and I would start to watch it, and I would always want to see them, like, cross the Red Sea or whatever, and I would always fall asleep before that happened, because it's like four hours or something like that, you know. But regardless, we know, we know the end of the story, but at that point, they didn't know that end of the story. Nobody had guaranteed that anything was going to be different other than a massive slaughter of Israelites that day. How about you? Where's your back up against the wall? Are there pharaohs chasing you down right now? Are there back to Egypt committees who are barking in your ear? People telling you that it can never be better than what it is today. Sometimes, friends, we need to, to pump the brakes, to be still, to listen to that voice of God. Remember last week, Elijah, he heard the voice of God through that quiet whisper. God may speak to you through a quiet whisper. He may lay something upon your heart. He may speak to you through a member of your community group or your family. He may speak to you through a sermon. He may speak to you when, when you read the Bible each day. He may speak to you when, when you take that quiet time with him and you just listen. God, what do you have for me? He may speak in a whole variety of different ways. Whatever way he does, we've got to take the time to listen. Listening to God is not an easy thing. We struggle to listen to people who are right in front of us, right? <laughs> Some of you, your spouse is elbowing you right now, right? We struggle to listen to those who audibly speak to us. It's even more difficult to listen to God who doesn't always audibly speak to us. But yet that presence of God is with us. The Bible tells us when, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, he fills us with the power of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us all the time. For the Israelites, they had this glory of God. That pillar of fire would go with them at night and a pillar of cloud in the daytime to, to go before them. And the, the uh, biblical term for that is, is Shekinah glory. Uh, the word meant God's presence that was always there. No matter what. God's presence was always there with them. And that same presence is there in your life and in my life. The question is, how well do we do at listening to it? How well do we do at focusing on it? How well do we do at pumping the brakes so that we can actually hear the voice of God? Remember that statement earlier, we pray as if everything mattered, or pray as if, I've not, forgot my statement. Pray as though everything depends on God. I need to memorize it myself, don't I? And work as though everything depends on you. I bet for every one of us, we struggle with that in one way or another. Either we, we struggle to pray or perhaps we struggle to act. Uh, for me, I, I'm someone who, who acts a lot <laughs> and prays 
less than I should. And that's not good. I have to work. I don't have to work to make myself act. That's my default setting. I have to work to slow down and to listen to God because everything does depend on God, right? I remember one, uh, probably the worst example of this in my life, uh, when it was 2012, February, uh, I came to Stillwater for the first time, just learned that I was being appointed here. And as Methodist pastors, we were sent here by the bishop, right? So uh, we came, met here with everybody at the end of January, and it was wonderful. We were excited about coming here. And so then went back home um, to the church that I was serving and had until July 1st when I would be moving. Challenge was at the church where I was at. It was a large church, and I was in um, a role, um, as executive pastor role, where we had just restructured uh, about a year earlier um, to have uh, have it so that I was directing everything. Our pastor was kind of on his way towards retirement. I was supposed to follow him there, and so so we had a big problem then. We had to restructure the entire church once again, and we only had just about three months to get that done. And so it was just nonstop work. Because we, were, we were going at it nonstop, uh, trying to get things done. Um, by the same token, I soon learned uh, so, some facts about Stillwater that were concerning, like we had a year and a half or so before we were going to be bankrupt if we didn't lose any money, which was a concern of mine, right? Uh, and so we knew that, that I needed to get engaged at Stillwater earlier as well. It wasn't going to work to wait till July uh, because the level of things we were going to do needed to start right then. So I found myself just going all the time. From, from early in the morning till I'd fall in bed at night, do it all again the next day. And most of these things involved meetings and talking with others because it was kind of helping, giving guidance to which direction we would go. And, and my voice started to get sore. That was a new thing for me. Never really had that issue. Thought I had a cold or something like that, but I did my typical thing, which is just push on through, just keep on going. And and it got worse, and it got worse, and I would struggle to get through sermons, and then the next couple days, I couldn't talk, and, and then it would come back, though, and so then I would just keep on talking, uh, and did that for a couple weeks, and I got to where I couldn't talk hardly at all. Finally, I uh, decided to do something intelligent and visit a doctor, and the doctor said, we were fortunate with our church to have a connection with the best voice specialist there in Cincinnati, and I got to see him that very next day. And I went in, I remember he did all sorts of tests, and they stick things down your throat, and it's lots of fun, let me tell you. And, and he said, you're going to have to stop talking for, for quite a while. And I said, it's a very squeaky voice, but I said, when you say stop talking, how much talking do I get to do, you know? Like, what, what level? He said, you stop, zero words. And I remember just feeling my heart sink, like, well, this can't work. I, I've got stuff to do, right? You know, and, and I said, well, how long is this for? He said, minimum two months, and then we'll go from there. And when you start talking again, it will be very little for quite a while afterwards. And I was just shocked. I had never not been able to do my job before. And, and I realized that I had been spending all my time doing and very little time praying. I, I mean, yes, in the car, driving between things, random, you know, help, you know, these kind of prayers. <laughs> but not being faithful like I should. And it's amazing when you cannot talk how much easier it is to listen to God, right? <laughs> it's a whole lot quieter world when you can't say anything. And I learned a lot in those next couple of months. I learned a lot about God. I learned a lot about myself and my own need to rely more heavily on God and to listen to his voice because after all it all depends on him it's not dependent upon me hopefully you are smarter than me because for some of us it seems like it takes us to be <laughs> knocked onto our backs before we'll look up to him right and hopefully you're not doing that I get to uh, suck on cough drops probably permanently in my life when I talk because of what I did, right? No big deal. If that's the worst problem I've got, I'm cool with that. But, you know, it could have been a lot worse. And in your life, it could be a lot worse. You could be heading for a big crash because you're not listening to God. Or you could be missing out on some of the most important things in life because you're not listening to God. Friends, pump the brakes. We've got to learn this. We need, sometimes, friends, we need to stand still in order to move forward. 
the Israelites, they were going to move forward. I mean, Pharaoh's coming, right? We're not just going to stand here all day. We're not just going to have a permanent prayer meeting, right? But for a season, for a moment, Moses said, stand still and watch what God is going to do. Do the same thing in your life. We need to stand still so that we can move forward uh, because God, God rewards us when we do that. Let's check out what happened with the Israelites. The pillar of fire it is the great of God. You cannot breach the fire of God. Gather your families and your flocks. We must go with old speed. Yes, yes. Go where? The drown in the sea? How long will the fire hold Pharaoh back? Will it? After this day, you shall see his chariots no more. No! You'll be dead under them. No. The Lord of hosts will do battle for us. Behold his mighty hand. the sea with the blast of his nostrils. Lead them through the midst of the waters. His will be done. He opens the waters before them, and he bars our way with fire. Let us go from this place. Men cannot fight against a god. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine that? When you think that life is going to end and God parts the sea. Friends, he's still in the sea parting business, you know. He wants to part the sea in your life. These, these things where you're up against the wall, you don't think there's any hope. God wants to part the sea in your life. He can and he will. Will you stop and listen? Will you be still and know that he is God? Will you do as Moses said, stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today? And then when he parts the sea, Will you have the courage to walk through it? It's a position of, of listening and then acting. Listening and then acting. That's what God calls us to do, to pump the brakes so we can listen and then we can act. Moses acted for God. And you know, great movements of God usually involve some type of crisis where we need to stand still and to see what God does. We see that in church history. I bet you see it in your life too. If you look back at some of the great movements of God in your life, I bet you can say that there were moments where you needed to be still, where you needed to be quiet, where you needed to attune, tune your ears into the voice of God to listen to what he was saying and calling you to do. Friends, have the courage to do that in your life today. Where, where is God calling you to stop this week and to listen so that you can hear that voice? Would you pray with me? God, I praise you that you are still parting the seas this day. I pray for those in this room right now who feel like their backs are up against the Red Sea, Pharaoh's bearing down on them, and, and all they can hear is the voice of the Back to Egypt Committee. God, I pray that you would give them the discipline to listen to your voice, to take the time to set aside to hear what you are saying to them. God, if they need to seek the help of others, their community group, a counselor, a pastor, somebody else, God, give them the wisdom to do that this week. Lord, I pray that you would help us to listen to your voice, to put you first. And God, we're trusting then that you're going to help us to act to take the next step forward, to do those things that you're calling us to do. For Jesus, we just praise you as our Lord, as our leader, that we can follow you each and every day in our lives. For God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.